So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this in vivo clinical webinar being run with Empirical Labs today. Uh, my name's Anne White. I'm going to be facilitating and hosting uh, the webinar today. If you do have any questions after uh, the webinar, if you have any questions whenever you're listening to the recording, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Uh, the best way is to uh, email us at info at in vivo clinical dot co dot uk. Uh, so this afternoon, we are going to have a presentation from one of our newer nutraceutical partners, which is Empirical Labs, and I'll introduce Dr. Blair, who's going to be presenting shortly. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. We're going to have about 10, 15 minutes for that. So if there are any questions that come up as we're going through, please feel free to type those into the chat box. I'll pick those up and uh, we'll pick those uh, up whenever we get into the Q&A session. Um, but our topic tonight is uh, liposome technology in nutraceuticals and our presenter is Dr. Ema, uh, Emac Blair. Uh, Dr. Blair oversees R&D and quality insurance at Empirical Labs, who specialise very much in this area of uh, liposome technology. And Dr. Blair was actually involved in developing their proprietary technology. So uh, I think he brings a great deal of knowledge and experience in this area, which we're uh, very grateful to you for sharing this afternoon. So uh, I'll now hand over to Dr. Blair to run through his presentation. Thank you very much. All right. Hey, thank you for the kind introduction. I appreciate it. Um, so really what I'm going to be talking about today, while, while we use liposome technology, that's really the tool to help supplement difficult to absorb molecules, right? So the liposomes themselves are just a means to an end, right? And what I want to talk about is I want to talk about vitamin C and how to truly understand how to properly supplement it. And also two other molecules which aren't commonly talked about, which are glutathione and phosphatidylcholine. And later on in the presentation, I'll really get into why it, why it is that we haven't really been discussing these two molecules much um, around us. So let's just start off with something really, really simple, and such as our lifespan. Um, at one point, we're born, and eventually, we all pass away. Well, as it turns out, during birth, for instance, our brain is going to be comprised of almost 80% of its dry weight is going to be phosphatidylcholine. And when we die, it's going to be closer to about 25 to 30%. So it's a direct indication. So you can, you, you can literally track a person's lifespan by how much phosphatidylcholine in the body. And phosphatidylcholine is more than just part of the brain. It's what your cell membranes are made out of. It's what your liver is made out of. It's, it's really ubiquitous. It's throughout all of us. And it's what determines the integrity of our cells, the strength of our cells. So you can imagine if this is a straight line, perhaps there's a way to flatten the certain section out. Well, you know, we're probably here, right? We probably already haven't been supplementing with phosphatidylcholine our whole lives. And, you know, maybe we could start doing it so we keep our levels higher. And this is going to also be true for glutathione. And I'll talk about what glutathione is in a minute, right? And then we'll get here. So one way or another, you're going to get from this level to this level, but hopefully we can make, we can alter the graph to look like that. So glutathione, let's talk about what that is for a moment. Glutathione is, one of the, is another extremely important molecule in your body. It's most commonly found at highest concentration in your brain, in your liver, and in your eyes. It's a tripeptide, and its main function, its number one main function, is antioxidant protection. It's, in fact, called the master antioxidant. Without it, vitamin C doesn't work. Vitamin E doesn't work. Um, a lot of functions in your body don't, don't work because it's the second step in making energy, making ATP. It's how your body pulls heavy metals, poison, toxins, toxicants out of your body. So you can imagine that it's unbelievably important. And just like phosphatidylcholine, you can look at the ratio of the reduced, which is this version, versus oxidized, and you can tell a person's general health. When you're healthy, you have a lot of this version, period, and most of it is the reduced form. As soon as you get the virus, all your glutathione goes to fighting the disease, and it gets converted to this form. When you're exercising, once you start getting fatigued, once again, you start getting high on this version. So this is truly another molecule that you can track the health of your body. Um, so the other thing I, I didn't say... Uh, before is that every single cell in your body has it inside of it, 
ex except for some of your skeletal cells. That's it. So other than some of your bones, you have it literally in every single cell of your body. The main problem with glutathione is that your body is continuously making as much of it as possible. However, a lot of times we don't have the right ingredients and we don't have the machinery in our body to make enough of it. So what happens is that we have limited amounts in our body. And as we age, those amounts go down and go down and go down because our capacity for manufacturing it in our bodies also is diminished. Now, one of the main reasons that nobody's been talking about glutathione is because historically, if you took a pill with glutathione in it or food with glutathione in it and you ate it, your stomach would just break it apart into its three amino acids, glycine, cysteine, and glutamate. Okay, So basically, its absorption rate was well below 0.1%. Basically, it was a waste of money. However, now we have the tools to be able to supplement it, and that tool is called the liposome. And in a minute, I'll go into what that means. So the next molecule we want to talk about is vitamin C. And this is another one of those molecules that you can track a person's life with. We know that people with high levels of vitamin C are healthier and live longer than those with low levels. That's, throughout the literature, that's a well-known fact. It's a powerful antioxidant. It protects your DNA. Once again, though, you need glutathione to activate vitamin C, and then it's able to protect your DNA. Then it can act as an antioxidant. Another part that people really don't talk about vitamin C very much, but it's essential for moving fat into the mitochondria, where it is used for energy. So without vitamin C, you can't put fat into your um, power plants in your cells to burn it up. So without vitamin C, you can't burn fat. Um, and the other thing that's really, really important about vitamin C is it's, it's integral in synthesizing collagen, which is, you know, what our skin, our blood vessels, our tendons, ligaments, bones are all dependent on collagen uh, manufacturing. Otherwise, they're just not rigid. They fall apart. So here, let's look at this is a graph of absorption of vitamin C. So if you take more than 60 milligrams of vitamin C, most of it ends up in your urine, not in your body, right? So basically, d don't worry about what these numbers mean, but basically it shows you right here that after you get to about 200 milligrams of vitamin C, it doesn't matter whether you take 500 milligrams, a gram, two and a half grams, the amount that your body absorbs is all the same, right? So all those times when we take our one gram vitamin C tablet, it just all ends up in our urine. And that's what this is showing, that as you increase the dose, just to get more vitamin C in your urine, right? So the question is, if we know that vitamin C is integral, and we want to increase the amount, how do we increase the amount, right? So um, this is just a little bit more information about glutathione and some of the what low glutathione levels are associated with. Um, neurodegenerative condition, especially your brain, is the uh, highest amount of glutathione in your body. Um, and one, we already talked about how it's broken down. Now, to increase, we just talked about how, you know, potentially how you would increase vitamin C. But if you tried to increase glutathione, traditionally, you would take precursors such as cysteine, anacylcysteine, and methionine. However, these are often toxic at a high amount. So you want to increase glutathione, but you don't want to increase body toxicity. So, the solution to this is the molecule we were talking about earlier, which is phosphatidylcholine, right? It's part of every cell in your body. It comes from soy, sunflower, eggs. What's happened is, as people have become more concerned with cholesterol, we stopped eating eggs. But as we stopped eating eggs, we also stopped getting phosphatidylcholine, which is the white part in the egg, right? Um, so now people aren't eating phosphatidylcholine, and they're getting what's known as non-alcoholic fatty livers. So basically, by not eating eggs and phosphatidylcholine, we're getting alcoholic livers without the alcohol. So, you know, basically we're getting sick without all the fun that's associated with that. So it's so good right now that pharmaceutical companies are trying to turn it into a drug. And what they're trying to do is register it as a drug just like anything else that you'd have to buy in order to supplement yourself because they're trying to get you to have lower cholesterol so you don't need eggs, but now they want to give you a drug to make up the difference. And the great thing about this, though, is that phosphatidylcholine is very, very well absorbed. So what we do is 
we take all the phosphatidylcholine, and this is its structure. And what we do is we turn it into a little cell, just like this. All right. And inside of the cell, we can put the glutathione, and we can put in the vitamin Cs. So basically, what happens is when you ingest it, your body just sees the phosphatidylcholine, which is this part, and it absorbs it at very, very high rates. And all the stuff that's inside of there comes along for the ride. So rather than the vitamin C being rejected through your urine, it gets absorbed into your body. Rather than the glutathione getting broken down by your stomach acids, it's protected by this little cell, this little liposome. Um, it's made out of completely natural phosphatidylcholine, so it's non-hydrogenated, non-hydroxylated. It's very, very stable, and it is water-soluble. So if you pour it into water, it's going to disperse out immediately. And for many of you guys that have already used this product, what you'll see is that it has the, almost the same consistency, the same look, the same function as milk. And the reason is, is this is literally a copy of natural breast milk. Um, this is how mothers nurture their babies, is they have vitamin C and they have different nutrition in these kind of cells in their milk. And then because babies' digestive tracts aren't capable of absorbing very much, this still works. Okay, the liposomes still are able to deliver this really, really important nutrition. So let's take a look at what this stuff really looks like under a microscope. So if you were a, to look under a microscope, and this little bar right here is 400 nanometers. Okay, so this is really, really small. This is called scanning electron microscopy. Um, what you can see is these tiny little bubbles. And depending on how we, we slice these little bubbles, some of them are going to be convex and some of them are going to be concave. But this is really cool. This is literally a picture of the liposomes under a microscope. Um, there's other products out there on the market. However, when you look under a microscope, you see that they're just a foamy mess. There's really nothing there. It's just uh, it says liposome on the label, but there's nothing inside of there. Okay? So the liposomes in our products are 95% of them between 50 and 420 nanometers. And it's independent of the payload. So whether it's the glutathione or the vitamin C, it doesn't matter. It's always going to be the same nice little tiny particle, which is similar in size to what's found in milk. Um, I do want to point out that this is a 100% vegan product, non-dairy. Okay. So let's. So the other advantage of, of liposomes is that that the, the types that we make is we use a very gentle processing method. So there's room temperature and room pressure, so we don't get any degradation of phosphatidylcholine, the glutathione, or the vitamin C. We use only natural and health-building materials, um, so we don't add synthetic flavoring or anything unnecessary. The label is very, very simple. When you look at the label, there's only a few ingredients. Okay, so now let's just get down to the science. And what we're seeing here is, this is the first example. So this product is literally the first example of a liposome in nutritional supplements that actually works. So in this graph, what we have, and this is clinical data, so it's on a human being. And the nice thing about where our factory is, is we're right next to a university. So for about $50, a college kid will do almost anything. So what they let us do is, give them regular powdered vitamin C and pull their blood every 45 minutes. And what you see is that you get an increase, which peaks out at about, you know, two, two and a half hours, and then it kind of comes down after about six hours, right? So this is five grams of sodium ascorbate, or sorry, of ascorbate as sodium ascorbate, and this is the saturation point of the blood, right? So before that, this is the highest vitamin C level anybody could attain via an oral method. And then we did the same thing, but we gave them the liposome. So what you see is that it goes up much faster. And the difference between this and this isn't a third. It's not the difference between two and three. And that's due to blood equilibrium. This is really probably something like 10x absorption of the vitamin C. Um, what you see is it climbs faster, it gets higher, and then it stays up for longer. And for this particular individual, um, you got elevated vitamin C levels for 12 hours. What's really nice about this, if you take this product twice a day, you get heightened ascorbic acid levels, vitamin C levels, in your body all day long. 
This was the previous attempt by a different company to get increased vitamin C absorption. And as you can see, the, vitamin, the regular powdered vitamin C and the liposomes are almost identical. And both of these graphs are the same as this graph. They're just on different uh, edges. So what's nice is here is proof that we actually can deliver vitamin C at much higher levels than was ever able to before. The other nice thing about that cell that we're talking about is that at five grams of sodium ascorbate, um, a little over half of the subject, so it's um, talking about 25, 26 people, um, had stomach issues. They basically, they took the sodium ascorbate, they did the blood test and half, you know, halfway through 45 minutes when they weren't getting their blood drawn, they were having stomach upsetness and what's known as osmotic diarrhea. Um, however, with the liposomes, 0% of the subject, and these are the same subjects, so one day they came in for the powder and the next day they came in for the liposomes. So the same people that previously had stomach issues no longer had any stomach issues with liposomal vitamin C. The other thing that we looked for was what's known as ischemia reperfusion injury. Okay, and this is this is a model of the kind of cardiovascular injury that you get or heart injury that you get during a heart attack. Okay, um, so we did this on 16 healthy adults. Uh, once again, these were all um, people from the university, some of them professors, some of them students, um, who were interested in finding out more about their bodies. Um, and what we see here, this is for the placebo. Okay. So they go here, they, they put a cuff on their arm basically, and we cut off the circulation to their arm for 20 minutes, and we track the increase of cardiovascular damage in the arm. Obviously, we can't actually give somebody a heart attack because we don't want to kill them. So what we do is we give them um, an injury which they can recover from just in their arm. So you can see that basically here, their oxidative stress goes up many, many fold. Okay, this, this is, uh, um, it goes up dramatically. However, when we give them the liposomal vitamin C, we increase the oxidative stress, but the damage due to oxidative stress actually went down. So even, by, even when we were increasing the amount of oxidative stress, the, the cardiovascular system was actually still getting healthier and healthier because it was being protected by the vitamin C that, uh, that was already in their arm. So, this is quite amazing data. This is the first data of its kind showing really how powerful vitamin C can be, especially during um, an event such as heart attack or other kind of reperfusion injury events. Um, so the other thing you can imagine is if you're an athlete or if you like working out or if you like to exercise, when you exercise, your oxidative stress goes to the roof because you breathe a lot and you burn a lot of oxygen. So obviously you're going to get a lot of oxidative damage. So you can imagine that if you were to take this during, uh, while you're exerting yourself and exercise, you'd be able to have better endurance and better protection for your cardiovascular system, which is really, really important, especially if you exercise regularly. The next set of data, and this is with liposomal glutathione product, is we wanted to look and track glutathione levels in a person's body. However, as it turns out, there's no reliable way of measuring glutathione in the blood. Um, I looked high and low for various different labs, and what I found out was that the numbers were not very reproducible. I would send them five identical blood samples, and I would get five very, very different results back. So we decided to look at secondary markers of glutathione. Because glutathione, like what we talked about, uh, I mentioned before, it is critical to the body's detoxification system. So if you've ever looked at blood mercury and mercury detoxification, you know from the literature that it takes about three months to just get the needle moving and just to get the numbers a little bit down on blood mercury. What we saw here is that within a week, people's blood mercury levels were already going down. And after a month, they, for many people, they were dramatically reduced. Now, this subject right here started off with no blood mercury and ended up with no blood mercury. So this guy is extremely healthy. But what we've also shown is that at least our product isn't introducing any mercury into the body, which we already know that from, from our lab testing. So this is really, really great data. It's showing that the glutathione is being delivered quickly uh, in an efficacious way and reducing blood mercury levels. 
what we did was we then expanded it to seven human subjects, subject number three and subject number six. Um, both had no blood mercury to begin with, nor any at the end. But what you can see for subjects one, two, four, five, and seven is they start off with higher levels of, of mercury and ended up with much lower levels of mercury. And this was within four weeks. This is only 28 days. Um, had we expanded the study, um, so let's say three months, these levels would have continued to go down and down. And this person started off with 1.3 and then ended up with a non-detect level for blood mercury. So this is really, really exciting, good data. But more importantly, it shows the glutathione is being delivered. So we also looked at bilirubin. So for subjects five, six, and seven, and bilirubin is a really, really great example of liver function. So bilirubin are basically dead blood cells, and the lower your bilirubin levels, the better your liver is functioning because it's able to kick out the dead blood cells. And what you can see here for all three subjects as we measured their bilirubin, in four weeks, their bilirubin levels improved dramatically. Something that was unexpected was the creatinine levels also went down for these subjects. And the reason we decided to look at that is because there's a lot of data showing that, that, that you can track renal failure with glutathione. So as the renal function, as your kidney functions go down, your glutathione levels also decrease, and it's a one-to-one -one association. So we figured out, well, maybe if we increase glutathione levels, creatinine levels would go down. And that's exactly what we saw for these three subjects. Um, so for glutathione, while we weren't able to measure it directly, we were able to see that the blood mercury levels went down, bilirubin levels went down, and creatinine levels went down. So I hope uh, during this talk I showed you that structurally we have a highly controlled system where we're able to make these tiny little bubbles to go around the nutrition, that these bubbles then increase the absorption and also had a function of a little bit of type and release. They protected the payload and protected your stomach from payload, right? So people weren't getting stomach upsetness when they were taking um, this product. Uh, for glutathione specifically, we can see that it's a delicate material, and but now we have a way of avoiding the precursors because the precursors themselves can be very, very toxic. And that you increased general well-being and health in many human subjects. So that's the conclusion of, of my, my talk, and I'd be happy to open it up now for any questions or for me to clear up anything that perhaps I didn't explain clearly enough. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Blair. Um, I think, so if anybody does have any questions, if you can please just type those into the chat box, um, I will pick those up and read them out, uh, and we will deal with those. So while people are just doing that, I mean, one of the things that really struck me while you were talking was there's obviously some really compelling clinical evidence around using this technology um, for uh, delivery of different nutraceutical products. But um, are there any are there any types of clients or patients that we might be dealing with that are particularly suitable for this technology? So we know, is it people maybe with particular gut problems or indeed are there particular gut problems that mean people aren't so appropriate for this technology? Are there anything like that or is it generally appropriate? No, no. I mean, the, the, the great thing is this is, you know, this isn't something synthetic. This is a natural product. It's a model of milk. So it's really designed for all of us, all of us across the board, um, you know, because because it's just like a model of milk. It's a copy of milk. It works with your digestive system, regardless of how well you absorb nutrition regularly. This will get in. So, for people who who oftentimes get stomach upsetness or don't do deal well with nutraceuticals or vitamins, I mean, it's very very common for people to take um, some kind of comprehensive vitamin like a multivitamin, etc., and get a stomach ache or have some other unpleasantness in the bathroom. So th this, is, this is really a good solution for anybody who, who suffers from those, those kind of conditions. Cool. So uh, we have a question. Why is small uniform particle size important? Um, it's, so, so basically the particle size here is important just to show that we have control of our system. Um, it's also important to show that um, when you have a uniform particle size like this, and you know you always look for this kind of bell shape, um, 
it basically shows that the product is going to be reproducible time and time again. So if we made this product today, it's, going to, it's identical to what it would look like for the ones that we made, you know, two years ago, right? So we know we have good control, and we know we're going to get the same reproducible results because ultimately the particle size is only important in the fact that it gets you results, right? I mean, we're all looking for that result. We're all looking for that absorption for the lower blood mercury level, for low bilirubin levels, for the higher vitamin C levels in the blood, right? So this is just showing that we have good quality control. Cool. And then I guess from what you're saying, given that you want this to be replicating what you would find in nature, that obviously you get consistency of particle size in nature, and that's what you're trying to achieve. Exactly, exactly. This this is very similar to particle size we find in nature. Thank you. Cool. So we have a slightly different question now. Um, Can you tell this practitioner if glutathione, uh, glutathione is beneficial or not for clients who are on chemotherapy? And if it is beneficial, is there any time during treatment when it should not be taken? So chemotherapy is a tricky one, and it's going to be very, very dependent on what kind of chemotherapy. So, for instance, if it's going to be um, some kind of metal-based chemotherapy, such as uh, cisplatin or, or molecules of that type, the glutathione will actually chelate the platinum and disallow the platinum from chelating the DNA from the cancer. So that would be a situation where you definitely wouldn't want to use glutathione. Okay? Um, unfortunately, there's no, there's no simple answer to this. It's, it's a case-by-case yeah. case scenario on whether or not it's going to make sense to do it. It's, it's patient by patient. Um, however, um, once all of that is done, once the chemotherapy is done, um, glutathione is really, really important in controlling things like inflammation and then bringing body toxicity down. So at some point, once you're done delivering the chemotherapy and you're like, okay, enough, it's done its job, you now need to pull all that toxic material out, this, is, this would be a great way to do that. Great. Thank you very much. Um, now, I knew whenever we were talking about this webinar beforehand, we were talking about the different products that you have and looking at different focus areas. And tonight you've spoken specifically about uh, vitamin C and glutathione. Can you just give us a little bit of insight into why you have chosen the particular nutraceutical products that you have to work with? Because obviously there are a huge range of different vitamins and minerals and, and other products that you could include in your technology, I assume. But obviously you've Absolutely. chosen to focus on a smaller range. Yeah, so, so I wanted to talk about, to start off with the more ubiquitous ingredients first, which is, you know, glutathione, vitamin C, and phosphatidylcholine. Um, Number one, they work together, right? Um, glutathione turns on vitamin C. Vitamin C then goes, turns around and turns on glutathione. Um, th- there's a lot of synergistic effects there. Um, the other thing is that these ingredients are really, really key to any kind of endurance activity. So if you plot anybody's blood levels while they're running a marathon, their vitamin C, their glutathione, or their phosphatidylcholine levels just plummet. All right? So... So these are really, really good ways um, to keep up your energy, to keep up endurance, uh, to keep up health. The other thing is about these three molecules is all three of them literally track your health throughout your lifetime. You know, by how high vitamin C is, glutathione is, phosphatidylcholine, you can tell whether you're healthy or you're getting sick or you are sick. So, you know, in our product line, we also have, you know, the Kirkman resveratrol combination and the omega-3 combination, the vegan uh, liposomal omega-3. DHA. Um, so those are more specific to things like heart health, um, you know, joint health, and brain health, uh, while these are really just across the board for absolutely everything. Um, and oh, there was another question that was just going through my head. Um, if anyone does have any other questions, by the way, just please uh, feel free to continue to type those into the chat box uh, and we'll pick those up as we go along. If I, I remember what the question was now. you um, In some of the clinical evidence, you were showing how the rates of absorption were obviously much more effective using the liposome technology rather than, you know, maybe some of the classic uh, powder type formulas. So if clients are using this technology, 
is could you say that actually they would need to take the nutraceutical for a shorter time because actually they're able to build up their levels so much more quickly using this technology? Yeah, correct. I mean, it, it gets the uptake is is much more quick. You can actually take much less of it. So you know, you know, because I talked about you know this this graph by the way. This is for five grams of vitamin C, but it would be the same if it was one gram of vitamin C. It makes absolutely no difference. So what's nice about the liposomes is you can take much less of it and get a much larger effect. Cool. Makes sense. Uh, so we have another question. Did I answer your question or? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's, you know, for some clients, um, you can have some quite interesting conversations. Well, you know about how long am I going to have to take this supplement? And I don't want to, maybe people aren't comfortable swallowing pills and they want to take them for as short a time as possible. So I think it's quite interesting to understand how different delivery methods can be used with different types of clients. And so it's useful to understand how this particular technology, you know, while it is appropriate across the board, regardless of what type of client you're working with, there are some specific applications that maybe it's particularly good for in terms of clients' lifestyles and preferences. Right. which is cool. So we have another question. If GSH is a heavy metal to later, are there dangers of using it um, where you would actually pull out heavy metals too fast? Uh, no, no. Uh, see, the thing is that glutathione can chelate metals, but really what it does is it, it turns on your body's natural detoxification system. Okay, so number one, it's going to be selective. So it's not, uh, you know, like a lot of people when they take EDTA, it just ends up attaching to whatever it sees first, right? It could be calcium, it could be mercury, it could be sodium. It, it, you know, EDTA is, uh, let's call it dumb. It just attaches to absolutely everything. Glutathione activates your body's natural detoxification system, which is much more intelligent. It can differentiate between what's toxic and what your body needs. So what's going to happen is it's, you know, it turns, the glutathione turns it on and it sees, let's say, a piece of mercury and it grabs a piece of mercury. If it sees a piece of calcium, it leaves it alone. You know, your body naturally recognizes the calcium and says, hey, I need this for cell signaling, I need this for bone, I need this for, you know, one of, you know, the thousand functions of calcium in your body. And it, it allows it to persist. So, so there's really no danger um, with glutathione that you're going to be pulling out either the wrong material or that you're going to be pulling out material too quickly because that's all going to be regulated in your body. This is not, um, this isn't going to override any of your natural defense mechanisms in your body. Great. Thank you. So uh, we have another question, which again, slightly different angle. Um, this practitioner deals with a lot of children in their clinic um, who show a low cholesterol level and some of them are autistic. Can they be given phosphatidylcholine? And if yes, how much? Yeah, for, for those kind of children. Now, what's, what's really interesting is um, the, the two molecules that are associated with uh, uh, brain development is omega-3 and phosphatidylcholine. Okay? So, and the reason is, is because that's literally what your brain is made out of. It's made out of an omega-3 attached to a molecule of phosphatidylcholine. That's, that's the majority of your brain, really. So, it's been shown for brain development, children who have more phosphatidylcholine, their brain develops at, at a, the correct pace, a much more rapid pace, and have fuller development of their brain. You know, and of course, you know, we talk about brain health, but that's what you want. You want a nice, full, healthy brain. Um, so, so this is actually something very, very common. Now, the problem is with just regular phosphatidylcholine. So if you just take phosphatidylcholine as a molecule or just as the liquid, the raw ingredient, a lot of times, it's especially by autistic children, it's not absorbed particularly well. You know, they have, you know, with all the gut issues that are associated with that. Um, so the phosphatidylcholine as a liposome is really great because it's in the correct form. It's the easy form for a child to absorb. Right. Once again, you know, let me bring it back to this is a model of milk, and it's literally designed for a digestive system that isn't fully mature. Right, that makes sense. And then, do you have any comments on dosage? Oh, on dosage. Um, 
that's going to be really dependent on um, how large the child is. But um, you know, it's not uncommon to see two grams of phosphatidylcholine being given to children per day. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have another question about phosphatidylcholine. Um, is it a separate product, or do you get it from the liposome? So is that you know people would buy the phyto, sorry, the phosphatidylcholine as a so product? That, that's what's great about about these products is you take it for the vitamin C and the phosphatidylcholine is the delivery system. But once the, the the nutrition, let's say the vitamin C or the glutathione is delivered, then the delivery system itself becomes nutrition. Which is quite different to a lot of other supplement products, <laughs> where actually they right, come with right. a whole lot of stuff that actually you wouldn't really want to take. <laughs> exactly, exactly. See, and that's, that's the whole concept behind it, is that every single part of this product is health building. You know, it, it's not just going to deliver it and then, okay, like you said, it's going to be, you don't want it around like magnesium stearate or some other kind of um, material. Literally, once it's done delivering, it then turns into part of your cell, part of your brain, part of your liver, part of your eyes. And, you know, you, you get all the added benefits of phosphatidylcholine. Great. Thank you. Um, well, I think one of the things that's been really useful in your presentation this evening was seeing some of the references and understanding some of the clinical evidence that exists behind the uh, liposome technology. Is this something, you know, is, is the academic evidence, you know, is there a lot of it? Is it something that will be easy for practitioners to go out and find if they want to do some more reading of their own after listening to the webinar today? There... This this is the, the the real issue out there, <clears throat> is that there is a lot of information out there about liposomes, but it's going to be mainly in the pharmaceutical arena. Okay, so it's going to be uh, synthetic. It's going to be a lot of it uh, via injection. Um, when we're talking about oral liposomal supplementation, there is not much data. In fact, this data isn't you know the data of my clinical study is only going to get published in probably three four months. Even my data isn't available to the public just yet. I mean, it's very soon to be. Um, the other problem is that there's a lot of misinformation out there, actually, on the web. You know, if you turn on YouTube, there's a million guys using, using jewelry cleaners to make liposomes. Well, that's not really what they're doing, or they're using their blender to make a liposome. I mean, really what they're doing is just poisoning themselves. But um, so if, if you do look for it, definitely only look for it in academic literature. Um, you have to ignore all the blogs and all the, the YouTube channels and all that kind of stuff because it's completely misleading. Um, you know, something that people commonly say is that this works better than uh, an IV product. Well, that's, that's a very loaded statement. The reality is this works really, really well in conjunction with, let's say, IV vitamin C or something like that. Um, while the concentration, the blood levels aren't going to be the same, um, there is an advantage to, you know, if you did an IV, for instance, right, it would go up and then it would shoot back down in about three hours. Well, that's great for those three hours, but what about the rest of the day, right? So, um, you know, a lot of people, there's just a lot of misinformation out there. You have to be careful. So I would just stick to the purely academic, peer-reviewed literature. Great. Good advice. Thank you. Um, if anybody does have any last questions, please feel free to um, type those into the chat box and uh, we will read those out while we're just waiting to see if there is anything else. Um, if you are interested in finding out more about the products um, and seeing the range that is on offer from Invivo Clinical, you can find those um, on our website, invivoclinical.co.uk. And if you go into the top little menu bar and click on brands, you'll see Empirical Labs in there and you can go in and look at all of the individual products. Um, and obviously, if you do want any more information or uh, anything else to help you decide whether they're right for you to use with your clients, please don't hesitate to uh, contact us and obviously we can put you in contact with Empirical Labs as well. Uh, if there is very specific information you need, that's no problem at all. So it looks like we don't have any more questions for now. So um, let me just say thank you very much to everybody who's joined us this afternoon for the webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Blair, for preparing your presentation and helping us understand just thank a bit you. more about this technology, which I think is still relatively new for us in the UK. Um, but it's been really useful to understand how we can use that uh, clinically and what the application is. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I wish everybody a good afternoon. Thank you.